Hey everyone, Nigel here. Just a couple of things before we get into the video. If you're wondering why I'm not on camera this week, it's because the haters have won. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The real reason is that I started working on a different story for this week, but it ended up being way too ambitious of an undertaking for our release schedule. As a result, I had to do a bit of a last minute pivot and things got kind of hectic. Honestly, I'm all right with it though, because today's video is actually one I've really wanted to do for a while. So yeah, let us know if this is something you'd like to see more of. The other thing I wanted to do is give a huge thank you to all of you out there because we have officially hit 300,000 subscribers on Crime Zone. Honestly, never in my or Luke's wildest dreams could we ever have imagined hitting such a big milestone and we couldn't have done it without your support. So honestly, thank you all so much. It's been a truly wild ride, and we're going to do everything within our power to make sure there's even bigger and better things to come. Anyway, with all that said, here are three photos and videos with disturbing backstories. The video you're seeing right now was taken in the front hallway of a house in Northern England in the early morning hours of December 21st, 2022. Without context, there's nothing all that out of the ordinary about it. A woman waits by the front door before greeting a man with a kiss, before the two of them head further inside. But what if I were to tell you that within just a few hours, this brief interaction would take on haunting new significance? Sadly, this is precisely what happened. Antonino Nino Calabro met Andrea Cardinale when the pair of them were both attending school to become professional casino dealers. By the time they had finished their training, they were very close friends. So much so, that when a job opportunity came up outside of their native Italy, they decided to take the leap together. In 2019, they both accepted positions at a UK-based chain called Grosvenor Casinos, ending up at a location in the English city of Stockton-on-Tees. For about three years, things went well for Nino and Andrea. They both got an apartment together in the nearby town of Thornaby and seemed to be enjoying life in the UK. Of course, being away from home had its challenges, but the friends tried to make the best of the situation. They would fly back to Italy whenever they could to visit family, and Nino would try to do nightly FaceTime calls with his parents, sister, and his fiance, 21-year-old Francesca Di Dio. However, as time went on, Nino and Andrea's experiences began to go in opposite directions. Nino really started to thrive at work, becoming not only well-liked by his co-workers, but a favorite amongst the casino's customers. Andrea, on the other hand, began to noticeably struggle. In September of 2022, he ended up losing his job altogether, with the 22-year-old supervisors citing his poor work ethic and, quote, odd behavior. Though they continued living together after Andrea was fired, Nino began to notice more changes in his friend's behavior. He was withdrawn, spending all day on his PlayStation, and it was obvious he had stopped taking care of himself. Without a job, Andrea also started to fall behind on the rent. All of this was concerning to Nino, but he knew that they had a trip to Italy coming up that November. He decided not to make a big deal out of the situation likely thinking that Andrea was just homesick and that spending time with friends and family was what he needed. During that visit, Andrea's family also became concerned about him. He was behaving unusually, and they suggested that he stay in Italy with them for a while, maybe even until after the holidays. However, Andrea refused and ended up flying back to England as originally planned. It would turn out to be a fateful decision. In early December, Nino's fiance Francesca, flew to England to stay with him and Andrea. The plan was for her to stay for Christmas, since Nino wasn't going to be able to make it home because of work. Within a short time of arriving, she too noticed Andrea's strange behavior. By this point, Andrea's parents were in contact with Nino, asking him to try and persuade his friend to come home for the holidays. Nino told Andrea's mother that he would do what he could. However, Andrea was insistent that he didn't want to go. When he still refused, even after they bought a plane ticket, Andrea's father decided to travel to England to see if he could convince his son in person. Sadly, 
as he would soon discover. He arrived too late. When Andrea's father got to his apartment just after noon on December 21st, there was no answer at the front door. The place was unlocked, though, so he made his way inside. What he found there was truly the stuff of nightmares. Inside the apartment, the father found the bodies of both Nino Calabro and Francesca de Dio. The couple had been horrifically stabbed and bludgeoned with a sledgehammer. It turned out that Andrea Cardinale had been suffering from undiagnosed acute paranoid schizophrenia. For at least the past few months, he had been hearing voices in his head, voices which had convinced him that his roommate and his roommate's fiance were out to get him. In particular, Andrea believed that Nino and Francesca were putting curses and spells on him, and he believed it was these curses that were causing all of his symptoms and the problems in his life. On the morning of December 21st, Nino had returned home from work around 2.30, where Francesca was waiting for him at the door. This is the footage we showed you at the beginning of the segment. It turned out that this would be one of the last moments of intimacy the couple would ever share together. Unbeknownst to Nino and Francesca, at that very moment, Andrea was in his room conducting the last of a long series of disturbing internet searches. These included searches about voodoo and, quote, how to remove the evil eye. Not long after Nino and Francesco went to sleep that morning, Andrea came into their bedroom armed with a knife and sledgehammer. He attacked Nino first, hitting him twice in the head to incapacitate him. Initially, Francesca managed to get away. However, Andrea caught her before she could escape the apartment. Disturbingly, the same camera that recorded the footage we showed you also reportedly captured video of Andrea dragging Francesca back into the apartment where she was also killed. Around two hours after Andrea's father stumbled across the brutal crime scene, police found Andrea wandering the streets alone. At the time of his arrest, he appeared to be in a daze. A more thorough look at the 22-year-old's internet search history provided further insight into his disturbed mental state ahead of the killings. Originally, he had planned to blow up the apartment with himself also inside. Following the fatal attacks on Nino and Francesca, he went as far as to purchase diesel fuel from a local gas station before returning and dousing the apartment in it. For reasons unknown, though, he left without igniting it. Because it was determined by multiple professionals that Andrea was experiencing the effects of an ongoing undiagnosed mental health condition at the time he killed Nino and Francesca, he was able to plead guilty to two counts of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. In October of 2023, he was sentenced to an indefinite term at a psychiatric institution. Understandably, the entire tragedy has been hardest for the family members and friends of Nino and Francesca, who were left struggling to come to terms with what had happened. Following the sentencing, both families made statements, with Francesca's mother saying, quote, Since her death, we can no longer find inner peace or comprehend what happened. We no longer sleep at night because our thoughts are all about our daughter. Nino's father, Salvatore, stated, meanwhile, quote, For parents, a child is an extension of life. For a sister, a shoulder to lean on and a person to ask for help. But unfortunately, this has been denied us. Not having Nino with us anymore, after having cuddled, helped, and supported him for 26 years is not easy to overcome. But with a lot of willpower and with the help of our Lord, we have to face the future as serenely as possible. Wedding photos are supposed to be treasured keepsakes, moments frozen in time to remind a couple of one of the happiest days of their lives, a day where they made a special commitment to one another and celebrated their love with friends and family. This is exactly how 39-year-old Michelle Farrow felt when she first saw this wedding photo of her and her husband Richard after they got married in 2018. That was, until she learned the truth about the man behind the camera. In the early 2000s, Michelle was a young model from Essex, England, just getting started in the industry, when she met a photographer named David Glover. 
The pair were both working at the same car show and got to talking, at some point deciding that they would try and work together. After setting up a time, Michelle went to David's studio. With his help, she was able to add a bunch of new photos to her modeling portfolio. Pictures which soon landed her jobs in women's fashion catalogs and car magazines. From then on, Michelle tried to work with David whenever she could. It wasn't just that all of the photos he took of her turned out really well. David also made her feel comfortable during their shoots and was good at building her up and just making it an overall positive experience. Eventually, the two of them became friends outside of work as well. It was for all of these reasons that when Michelle got engaged in 2016, there was only one person she trusted to be her wedding photographer. She and her fiancé Richard ended up hiring David, paying him £1,500, even after Richard's friend offered to do the job for free. A few days after the wedding, in May of 2018, Michelle felt even more confident in her choice when David sent over some of the photos for her and Richard to look at on their honeymoon. As always, David had knocked it out of the park, and she excitedly sent copies to all of her friends and family. A few of the most special photos she even framed to put up in her house. Little did she know that less than a year later, something would happen that would forever change how she saw them. One day in March of 2019, Michelle was scrolling through her Facebook feed when she saw a post from one of her modeling friends. The post was about David, and as Michelle began to read, she couldn't believe what she was seeing. She sent a private message to the friend, who quickly responded. The friend explained that while at David's studio for a photo shoot, she noticed an alarm clock in her dressing room that looked a little off. When she investigated further, she discovered that there was a camera hidden in the place where the device's speaker was supposed to be. The camera was recording to an SD card, which the woman managed to find and take out. When she looked at the footage, her stomach dropped. It revealed that David had deliberately set up the device to film her while she was undressing. It turned out that this was just the very tip of the iceberg, though. When the incident was reported to police, they conducted a more than two-year investigation, one which proved that this was far from a one-time thing. Ultimately, investigators recovered at least 900 videos of over 100 different women that David had secretly recorded while they were getting changed at his studio. To her horror, Michelle eventually learned that she was among the victims. After reaching out to detectives, she was sent an image of herself that had been taken from the dressing room, which she was asked to confirm for the purposes of the investigation. As if all of this wasn't enough of a gut punch, Michelle quickly realized when the video of her had been recorded. It was at a shoot just a few months before she had asked David to be her wedding photographer. On that particular day, she had brought along her soon-to-be husband, Richard, who had wanted to see her in action while she worked. Understandably, the stunning betrayal left Michelle feeling devastated and sick to her stomach. In a news article we came across while researching this story, she said that she hasn't modeled since everything happened, and isn't planning to ever again. She went on to say that David has made her second guess everything, and that she can't even go into a public bathroom anymore without checking for cameras. Of course, she stated her wedding photos are forever tarnished as well. Every time she looks at them now, all the happy memories are tainted by what David did. Following a lengthy investigation, David Glover was arrested and charged. At first, he tried to deny any responsibility, and even went as far as to argue that he didn't know that secretly filming people like this was illegal. Eventually, though, David pleaded guilty to five counts of voyeurism and was sentenced to one year and eight months in prison in March of 2023. In addition, he has been placed on the registry for 10 years and will be monitored for this same amount of time once he leaves prison. On first glance, this photo looks fairly innocuous. A car that's been loaded onto a tow truck, maybe because of a minor fender bender or some sort of roadside mechanical problems. However, as your eyes wander over to this part of the picture, you might start to notice 
that there's some deeper context that's not immediately apparent. Here's a closer look at that image. October 10th, 2008 was supposed to be just another fun night out with friends for 18-year-old Lucas Shortreed. It was the Friday before Thanksgiving, and he had gone to a party in Mapleton, a rural township in Ontario, located about 15 miles northwest of the city of Guelph. The get-together was a pretty standard one as far as teenage parties were concerned. Lucas spent the evening talking and catching up with a bunch of people. He also had a few drinks, though not so much that he appeared to be overly intoxicated. At around midnight, Lucas decided to call it a night and told his friends that he was heading home. They arranged a ride for him, but he insisted that he could use the walk and started off in the direction of his house. Sadly, he would never make it. A short time later, in the early morning hours of October 11th, a driver was heading down Wellington Road 17 near the community of Alma when they noticed something off to the side of the roadway. It turned out to be the body of Lucas Shortreed. When authorities arrived at the scene and began an investigation, it quickly became clear that Lucas had been struck and killed by another vehicle. The impact had inflicted horrendous injuries, including multiple rib fractures, a left tibia fracture, numerous lacerations, and had also severed his spinal cord. What's more, whoever was responsible had left him for dead. Understandably, this last piece was the hardest part for the 18-year-old's family and friends to come to terms with. An accident was one thing, but what kind of person could have hit Lucas and then simply kept on driving? Thanks to clues at the scene, as well as eyewitness accounts from the area around the time, investigators with the Ontario Provincial Police were able to narrow down the vehicle that they believe had been involved in the hit and run. They began looking for a white 1995-1997 to 1997 Dodge Neon sedan. Over the next few years, they would follow up on dozens of tips and leads. They looked at a number of white neons, but to their frustration, they were unable to find the specific one used in the crime. That brings us back to our photo from the beginning of the segment. As part of a broader campaign to keep Lucas Shortreed's case in the public eye, the OPP held a media event near the five-year anniversary of the crime in 2013. During the event, investigators reconstructed the hit-and-run, down to using the exact model of white neon that they believed had been used in the crime. The car was borrowed from a local couple named David and Anastasia Halliburton, just like other Neon owners in the area, they had initially been questioned following Lucas's death. However, they had been cleared after investigators did an inspection of their vehicle and found no damage to it. By doing this more accurate reconstruction, police hoped that they could help to jog the memories of any members of the public who might have information. Unfortunately, they were not successful, though little did they know that this photo would eventually take on haunting new significance. In order to see why, though, we have to fast forward a few years. In the summer of 2022, OPP investigators would finally get the break that they had been waiting for when they received information about evidence concerning the hit-and-run that had been concealed on a property in Mapleton Township. That property belonged to none other than David and Anastasia Halliburton. After obtaining a warrant, police conducted a search of the couple's property where they made a shocking discovery. While investigating a semi-trailer in the side yard of the residence, they discovered that the trailer had a false wall. Behind it was the white neon that they had been looking for for nearly 14 years. The vehicle was analyzed at the Center of Forensic Sciences, where it was determined that the damage to it was consistent with the impact that had killed Lucas Shortreed. Both of the Halliburtons were arrested the same day the vehicle was discovered. It turned out that on the night of the hit and run, David and Anastasia had been driving home from a friend's place when they hit Lucas while traveling down Wellington Road 17. They stopped long enough to confirm what had happened before deciding to leave the teen on the road without calling for help. At the time, the Halliburton's 11-year-old son was with them in the car as well. They lied and told him that they had hit a deer. 
David Halliburton would later admit that he had been drinking prior to the crime. Though disturbingly, in an intercepted call between him and his daughter, he attempted to justify his actions, saying, quote, Even if I was stone cold sober, I would have done the exact same thing. After returning to their home after killing Lucas, David and Anastasia took steps to cover up the crime. Before police could question them, they purchased an identical white Dodge Neon, then swapped out the license plates and vehicle identification numbers with the damaged car so that it would appear that they had never been involved. When the case went to court in September of 2023, David Halliburton pleaded guilty to failing to remain at the scene of an accident causing bodily harm or death and obstructing justice. He was sentenced to two and a half years in prison and banned from driving for three. Anastasia, meanwhile, pleaded guilty to obstructing justice and was given a six-month conditional sentence which included four months of house arrest and two months of curfew. She must also complete 200 hours of community service. While many people were understandably outraged by the lenient sentences the Halliburtons received, especially considering the lengths they had gone to in order to avoid facing justice for what they had done, it seems that Lucas's family took a different approach. In an interview after the verdict, his mother, Judy Moore, stated that justice isn't just what happens in the courtroom, saying of the Halliburtons, quote, They're being punished beyond the court system, by their family, their friends. They've lost their house, their sense of community. We have all the community support, and they've lost everything, as far as I'm concerned. Judy also pointed out that in all of the emphasis that was placed on what the Halliburtons did, she felt like the actual tragedy of the loss of her son was overshadowed. She said that Lucas was such a caring and kind young man, and that one of the hardest things is that she was robbed of ever knowing what he would have become in life. By all accounts, in the short time that he spent on this earth, Lucas Shortreed brought joy and kindness into the lives of countless people. He was known for being a gentle giant, the sort of person who thought a lot about other people and always did his best to show that. One of the stories that we came across while researching this case that I think really sums this up was one Judy included in a Facebook post after the sentencing. In it, she describes how Lucas used to volunteer at a local long-term care home called Wellington Terrace. When he finished his volunteer season working in the gardens and planting flowers with the residents, Lucas threw a spaghetti lunch for the seniors that had worked with him. Judy said that she had no idea that he had done this until her son's funeral. He had never asked for any money or help from her to do it. Judy went on to say, that the best way we can all celebrate Lucas's memory is to live like he did. Try to bring kindness into the world, volunteer your time if you can, and try to help your community in whatever way possible. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, thanks so much everyone, and take care.